Welcome everybody um, to the first session of GIS week. Um, just gonna uh, wait a minute for more people to join us and then we'll get started. Okay, why don't we get started? Um, welcome to the Johns Hopkins University Virtual GIS Week. We have an amazing three days of sessions lined up, two sessions per day, including our keynote with Esther Garrity, the Chief Medical Officer and Health Solutions Director at Esri, which is tomorrow at 12 Eastern. You are currently in our first session on food systems dashboards. My name is Jamie Harding, and I'm a GIS specialist at the Johns Hopkins Center for a Livable Future, and I'll be moderating this session. I'd like to introduce our co-sponsors. GIS Week is sponsored by the Johns Hopkins Center for a Livable Future, an academic research center focused on the intersection of public health, the environment, and the food system, and the Johns Hopkins Spatial Science for Public Health Center, an academic research center focused on the development and application of spatial analytics, GIS, and spatial statistics for public health research. Before I introduce each panelist, I'd like to go over a few housekeeping notes. First, we will be recording this webinar and we'll make it available after our sessions are complete. And second, please post questions for the speakers in the Q&A box. We will have time for one question for each speaker after their presentation, and then we'll have an open question and answer period at the end of the webinar. Now for our panelists. Jessica Fanzo is the Bloomberg Distinguished Professor of Global Food Policy and Ethics at the Berman Institute of Bioethics at the Bloomberg School of Public Health, the School of Advanced International Studies at Johns Hopkins University. She also serves as the director of Hopkins's Global Food Policy and Ethics Program and as director of Food and Nutrition Security at Hopkins's Alliance for a Healthier World. She is the editor-in-chief for the Global Food Security Journal and leads on the development in collaboration with GAIN of the Food Systems Dashboard. From 2017 to 2019, um, Jessica served as the co-chair of the Global Nutrition Report, the UN high-level panel of experts on food systems and nutrition and the Eat Lancet Commission. Rebecca McLaren is the associate faculty and a research scientist at the Johns Hopkins University Berman Institute of Bioethics and the Global Food Ethics and Policy Program with the past experience in both medicine and farming. Her interest now is on understanding health, nutrition, food systems, and the complicated relationships between them, as well as how we can create food systems that are sustainable and nutrition sensitive. Jason Lusk is a distinguished professor and head of the Agricultural Economics Department at Purdue University. He serves on the executive committee of the USDA National Agricult Agricultural Research Extension Education and Economics Advisory Board. Jason is a food and agricultural economist who studies what we eat and why we eat it. He has been interviewed and published editorials and outlets such as the New York Times, Wall Street Journal, USA Today, and the Washington Post, has appeared on numerous network and national cable television shows, has published in peer review journals, and has authored five books. He is a fellow and past president of the Agricultural and Applied Economics Association. Um, Pahini Lambert is the city stat analyst for Baltimore City Mayor's Office of Performance and In Innovation. During the pandemic, she's been tasked with monitoring and supporting food distribution. In response to this challenge, she created an internal dashboard designed to be used by high-level decision makers to understand the scope and status of food distribution by city agencies on a daily basis. She also developed a Find Nearby app used by Baltimore residents to find locations distributing meals and grocery boxes near them. She feels privileged to serve the citizens of Baltimore City during this crisis and is here to share the story of the challenging yet effective city food response managed using GIS maps and apps. And I will stop sharing my screen 
and turn things over to our first speakers. Um, Jess and Rebecca, would you like to share your screen and take over? Great, thanks so much, Jamie, and to the Center for Livable Future for inviting us to be a part of this panel. So we're going to present, Rebecca and I will present um, a food systems dashboard. So the food systems dashboard um, was launched in June of this year, June 1st. Um, and uh, it was a labor of love between multiple institutions, including Johns Hopkins University, which the Center for Livable Future is, is, was part of this uh, creation of the dashboard. A Global Alliance for Improved Nutrition, some other universities, including Michigan State and, and University of Michigan and the UN agency FAO. So this is our organizing framework of how we established our dashboard. I know this is quite a busy figure, but it's a, an articulation of the components of food systems. So on the left, you have food supply chain. So the way food is produced, it moves through a system, it's packaged, it's manipulated, and it hits markets. You then enter what, what many of us in the nutrition space call the food environments. This is where consumers engage with the food system and make choices about what to buy. Those food environments have many attributes that influence decision-making of what to buy or, or to order. And of course, consumers are part of the food system. They bring with them their own sets of factors that influence their decision-making on, on choices around diets. And along the top are drivers of food system change, food system transformation in both positive and negative directions. And these, of course, all, all these components influence outcomes of food systems, including nutrition and health outcomes, diet outcomes, environment, economics, and sociocultural outcomes. So when we established the dashboard, we wanted to organize ourselves to try to find indicators that represented the totality of food systems across this framework. So the, um, oh, I think I'm, I'm really not in the right spot. Sorry about that. Sorry, everybody. Um, so why have it? Why have a food systems dashboard? Well, there's been um, really a quite increased international attention on how um, food systems are shaped um, and, and their outcomes. But policymakers are often in the dark on how to manage their food systems. You know, food systems are complex. They have many elements, as I showed in that framework, uh, many different interactions, many different actors working across food systems. So policymakers are often in the dark on how to manage those food systems and what direction their food systems are, are going towards for their citizens. So there's a real need for tools to contextualize food systems, to show linkages and feedback loops and trade-offs that, that uh, take place when people make decisions about food system directionality. And we found that much of the data on food systems is across many different websites, many different databases, sometimes very hard to find, sometimes hard to navigate. And we found that it would be really useful to have a dashboard that pulls all that data together in one place that's easy to understand. One of the big drivers for us to create that, the dashboard was also that global malnutrition is a massive uh, issue, it's universal. Some of the statistics around global nutrition are worsening like obesity. Uh, we now have 2.1 billion people who are obese. Hunger is worsening, particularly the last four years and COVID will not help. And we still have a significant burden of undernutrition in the world. 20% of children under the age of five are stunted still significant number of children acutely malnourished due to conflict and seasonal hungers. So we have a massive, massive burden of malnutrition and not one country is immune. So what is the dashboard and what is it meant to do? Well, first of all, it describes national food systems 
And that's what it does currently. So you can go to the dashboard and we'll show you a bit of how to use it. And it describes all the facets of different food systems around the world. Um, you can potentially this coming January diagnose food systems. How are they doing to meet outcomes like diets and nutrition? Are they doing well? Are they not doing so well? What, what are they doing well on? What are they not doing well on? And then what actions can you take to improve food systems? And that's the decide. So we call it the three Ds, describe, diagnose, and decide. We want to uh, ensure that a range of users go to the dashboard, use it, um, and, and, and give feedback on it and use it for their national decision making, of course, policymakers at country, regional, and global levels, uh, but also UN, NGOs, civil society, and of course, academics and researchers will find it useful. This is the home page um, where you can go in through multiple areas. Go, you can just learn about food systems. It gives a 101 tutorial on food systems. But there's two other entries. One is through country profiles and through compare and analyze. And, and Rebecca and I will show you a little bit of that. Here's that framework where we try to populate indicators across this entire framework. And what we have is 175 indicators representing most countries and territories in the world. And you can see that we have, for example, about 24 indicators across drivers of food systems, 30 plus indicators on food supplies, 45 indicators on food environments. And this January, we're gonna be populating the dashboard even more. We're gonna go up to probably about 230 indicators, many of them being environment indicators many of them um, being uh, created through GIS type methodology. So keep a lookout for that. So one way to go through is through country profiles. Country profiles um, allow for you to get a snapshot of a country. They're very visually appealing, easy to understand, don't require you to, to dig through data to see what you're looking for. So country profiles are great for those who are not really savvy with data and just want to print out a quick snapshot of a country's food system. I'll turn it over to Rebecca. Great. So this is the other entry point that Jess mentioned, the compare and analyze. And this is for users who have more experience with data and really want to do a deep dive looking at all the indicators. Um, if you go to the next slide. Um, you can see some of the different ways you can look at indicators. So those more than 175 that we have, you can choose from any of those and then choose how you want to view it, whether that's on a map, um, by a bar or line graph, or using the bubble chart view. Um, so on the next slide, um, you can see there's a few different ways to look at the data as well, um, by income classification, the typology, or by region. So here, um, you can see by income classification. So you can pull up a map that shows each country. Um, and then once you're in that view, you can select any of the indicators and view um, the data by quartiles by income classification. And then on the next slide, you can see um, something similar by the typology. So the typology is on the dashboard. Um, there are five different food system types, rural and traditional, informal and expanding, emerging and diversifying, modernizing and formalizing, and industrialized and consolidated. So on that top map there, you can see those five different types and where each country falls um, for the 146 countries that we have the typologies done for. Um, and then the typologies used a composite index score that looked at four different indicators. They looked at agricultural, agricultural value added per worker, share of dietary energy from cereals, roots, and tubers, the number of supermarkets per 100,000 people, and then the percent of the population um, in urban areas. So then similar to the same way you could do for income classification in the bottom map, you can see, you can look at any one of those 175 indicators and see the quartiles for the data um, by the food systems type. And then on the next slide, you can see, you can also look at regional averages for any of those indicators. Um, next slide. 
So here's just showing an example of something you can do with the bubble charts. Um, so this is looking, using those food system types that I was just talking about um, and looking at the bubble size is um, sales of ultra processed food. And then you have obesity on the y-axis and um, per capita total consumption expenditures on the x-axis. And you can sort of see as countries are moving through these different food system types, how you can see increases in obesity as well as increases in sales of ultra processed food. And you might be able to look at that data and see if there's a way to find a different path for countries that are in that emerging and diversifying food system type to avoid those large increases in obesity. And on the next slide, um, the next two slides are showing outliers and how you can see, um, use the food system types to identify these. So in this case, looking at retail value of ultra processed food sales, um, and seeing within that um, industrialized and consolidated food system type, you can see Argentina and Spain have a lot lower um, ultra processed food sales. So that would be a positive outlier and what you might be able to learn from that. And then in the next slide, um, shows something similar, but with a negative outlier looking in um, the informal and expanding food systems type and seeing countries that have um, higher than average of those ultra processed food sales. So the next slide is showing just from the dashboard, you can either download all of the data, um, which would just include all of those 175 indicators for all countries and all years that they're available. Um, we are working on improving that interface so that you could um, choose which indicators you're interested in and which countries and just make it a little bit easier to download in a more usable format because right now you just get a really large file that has all of the data. Um, so that's something we're hoping to do next year. Um, you can also download all the metadata. So either when you're on the site, you can view the metadata or you can download it in a big spreadsheet. And that includes things like the definitions for each indicator, their relevance, so how they relate to our food systems framework and why they're important within food systems, things like calculations, if it's a calculated indicator and limitations. Um, next slide. So as just mentioned, some of the work that we're doing right now on diagnose and decide. So just a little bit more on the diagnose work. Um, so we've chosen indicators um, within each area of the framework that just showed. And for those um, key indicators, we've been setting thresholds for those. Some are pre-existing sort of globally agreed upon thresholds and others are ones that the team is identifying themselves. And then based on where countries sit in those thresholds, being identified as either green, yellow, or red. And then for countries in the red, that would be potential challenges to highlight um, that might need to be addressed. And then the next slide gives a little bit more information about the DECIDE work that just mentioned. Um, so we've been working with um, Corinna Hawks and her team uh, who has been trying to identify a no regrets list of actions um, that have been distilled down from 12 reports where they've looked at over 200 recommendations from those reports and identified around 40 of those. So we are working to um, pair those with our framework so that based on um, challenges that are identified in the diagnose work that could then be linked with potential actions that countries could take um, from this no regrets work. And then the next slide just talks a little bit more about, Jess mentioned we were trying to add a lot more data. So we're continually just updating data for the indicators that exist and then always also looking for new indicators to add. Um, so in early 2021, we're hoping to add a lot more indicators as Jess mentioned um, that will cover, really give more depth in the environment and sustainability side of the dashboard. Um, and some of that will include some geospatial data, including some data on farm size and land use and also on climate um, from NASA and another group um, that Mario Herrero has been leading. Um, then other data on sort of local burden disease, cost of diet, other indicators that have either been suggested to us or we've identified. Um, so we're always looking for indicator suggestions if people see things that they think could be good additions to get in touch with us about those. Some other work that's coming up is um, country engagement. So always trying to make sure that the dashboard is useful to folks um, and that people know about it as well. So we just had the first part of a workshop in Senegal um, remotely, but planning to do more remote and hopefully in the coming year in-person events as well and have another workshop planned in Ethiopia. 
and then are also planning to create subnational dashboards that we would hope that countries would be able to take ownership of and really shape to their own uses. Um, and that that would also include subnational data as well. Um, so really, right now it's all national data on the dashboard, but we're hoping to expand that a lot in the coming year. Um, so that's a brief yeah, overview of the dashboard and what's there now and what we hope will be there in the near future. Um, and yeah, happy to take questions and always interested in feedback from folks who are able to visit the dashboard and get in touch with us. Uh, thank you, Jess and Rebecca so much. That was a wonderful presentation. Um, just wanted to do a quick question before we transition over to Jason. Someone asked, uh, how did you determine what is considered a supermarket? And I thought that was a great question considering you're dealing with countries around the world and not every supermarket, um, like we consider in the United States, may look the same in different countries. So when you're putting together data sets, um, how did you uh, consider what to use and what not to use? Rebecca, do you want to answer that? I don't, I don't remember how, we, we got the data from Euromonitor and I'm not, I don't remember how they classified if you, if you know Rebecca. Mm -hmm. I'd have to, have to double check, but yeah, we used Euromonitor's classification for that. Um, so that would be something that there is some of that information in the metadata um, on that indicator. And then also um, we could get more information from your monitor if needed. Perfect, thank you both again. And uh, at this point, I'd like to turn things over to Jason. Um, if you'd like to share your screen and uh, begin your presentation. Very good, well, good afternoon, everybody. It's a pleasure to get to talk about some of our research um, that we've turned into a dashboard in response to some of the issues surrounding COVID. So maybe to give you a little bit of motivation for why we created this dashboard, I'll, I'll walk you through some recent events that we all, all lived through. So if you think back to March, even in early March, we were starting to get some warning signs that um, coronavirus might be upon us. And we even saw some stories like this one in the US News and World Report, actually encouraging consumers to do some stocking up on groceries in light of some uh, anticipation of reduced um, mobility. And then sure enough, mid to late March, we all remember probably the shutdowns that occurred. And there were two really big demand shocks on our food system. One was a, a near destruction of demand for food away from home, restaurants, cafeterias, so forth. And then at the same time, a big spike in demand for food through supermarkets, through grocery stores. And we all lived through, through those moments, but I think you can remember the empty shelves that we saw probably for the first time, at least in my lifetime. Um, and it really was, I think, a little scary for a lot of folks. You know, another uh, factor that came along a little bit later in late April to mid-March was a, a different kind of shock. This was a, a supply side shock to the meat sector. Uh, here's the front page of the USA Today. Um, it's not often I get quoted on the front page of the largest circulating paper, so I thought I'd put my quote up there. But at one point, we were running about 40% below processing capacity in beef and pork sectors relative to the same period last year because plants were shutting down. Either workers weren't showing up or um, they had to shut down because a large number of workers in those plants uh, had contracted COVID. So, you know, these combination of events, I think we're raising lots of questions among the general public and at a, a large agricultural university like Purdue, we were getting lots and lots of questions about what's happening. And, and I'd say the number one big question that we were asked was, are we gonna have enough food to eat? And my intuitive response was yes. Um, agriculture is a seasonal business. Most of our main commodity crops are, have already been harvested, they're in storage. Um, but, you know, that was a gut feeling. We wanted a way to, to articulate that in a way to update it in real time in response to the developing COVID situation. And the real risks uh, came about, you know, really because of potential spread of, of COVID within the workforce. So uh, we were most vulnerable in my assessment where we had the most workers. And that's one of the reasons we saw uh, meatpacking so adversely affected. I, by the way, this is just data that bears out those same shocks that I mentioned that we lived through. Speaking of dashboards, this is a great dashboard, uh, by the way, tracktherecovery.com, Raj Chetty at Harvard and some others. This is uh, consumer spending uh, uh, track through 
credit cards and debit cards. You can see the big spike in grocery spending, the near you know fall off, almost 60, 70% fall off in spending on hotels and restaurants. Even today, we're still spending more at groceries and far less at restaurants. So uh, we're, not, we're not through this thing yet. Okay, so here was sort of my thinking in the developing of this, this dashboard. And this is a project, by the way, with, with Microsoft. Um, we have a regular working group uh, Microsoft supporting some research, agricultural research that's going on on campus. So when COVID hit, we, we just engaged in some conversations around what, what data can we provide to help provide insights as to what's happening and where the vulnerabilities may be. And so the first thing, as I mentioned, agriculture is seasonal and it's also location specific. So I've just shown you some examples here of, of different agricultural commodities. We, we know where different products are grown. So beef cattle are all over the United States. Uh, corn, more cent centralized here in the upper Midwest where I live. Um, broilers, Southeast United States, and you can pick even particular commodities like potatoes, which are more geographically concentrated. And, and the thought here is if for something happens, if a large number of people became sick, um, you know, if it's cows, if it's a county out here, well, it's maybe not very vulnerable because there's lots of other counties in the United States where, where cattle are produced. But maybe potatoes, you can start to see, well, we're maybe a little more vulnerable if you happen to get an outbreak in a particular set of counties, say in Idaho, or over here in, um, uh, in, in Michigan. And so uh, it was sort of this thought that we need to couple data on where products, where foods are grown with where people are. So we also know where, the, where farms are and, and farm workers. And then we also happen to have data that's being developed through other dashboards on where the COVID cases are. And the thought is we can combine these data sets to give us an estimate of the potential vulnerabilities to our food supply chain as to whether there could be outbreaks that are occurring. And so I'm gonna walk you just a little bit through how I make those calculations um, because they are, they are all estimates. The truth is we don't, we don't really know. Um, so some issues, uh, there are several data sets. The one we use is from John, the John, Johns Hopkins website um, uh, that report daily updates of cases and deaths by county. Uh, but that's really, there's no real systematic reporting of cases by occupation. So we don't know the number of farm workers or farmers per se that have, you know, come down with COVID. Um, so that's a challenge. So it's something we're going to need to estimate. Um, also, there's no, there also isn't great data on numbers of agricultural workers. Every data set that exists has some problems. Um, so we, we're, we're going to make some compromises and choose the best one for our purposes. It has good county level data uh, because as I mentioned, geographic location tends to matter a lot. Um, but moreover, it's not like we know, you know, which workers are allocated to which kinds of crops uh, or livestock. Uh, and in fact, in a lot of cases here in Indiana, where I live, farmers are doing multiple things. They may have hogs, uh, you know, corn and soybeans all on the same farm. So it's really hard to allocate labor. And then, as I mentioned, agriculture is seasonal. That's for now just something I'm going to ignore um, and say that the, the real risks depend on, on when these cases happen. And, and for now, that's just something that's not in our dashboard. But I'm going to show you our, our current dashboard and then some changes we intend to make here in the near future. So how, how do we calculate the potential number of agricultural workers that have come down with COVID? Well, we know the number of cases, Jay's a county here. Um, we know the total number of cases in a county from other data sets. We know the number of agricultural workers, K is a type of worker. And uh, for now, I'm just going to aggregate them all together. But we know the number of workers, and then of course we know the population. So if we make it, if we're willing to make an assumption that the you know that people in a county uh, you know come down with COVID at the same rate or proportional to their rate of their of ag workers to the population in that county, that gives us an, an expected number of agricultural workers that have COVID in a county. Um, so again, we don't know for sure, it's an estimate, but it's, uh, I think all, all things considered the best estimate we have. The one thing I will point out is this is not the same calculation as if you just summed up all the agricultural workers in the, in the country, divided by the total population of the country and multiplied it by all cases. So that's a different calculation. That's evaluating something at the, at the totals rather than taking a total of a bunch of individual counties. Um, so the other thing I'll say is we, we wanted to, again, our original purpose here was to try to calculate potential risk to agricultural output. So we have to make an estimate of how much agricultural output we're, we're using. 
So the Census of Agriculture gives us county level data on different commodities output, whether it's beef, corn, cattle, wheat, edible beans, what have you. We, we have that data by county. We know the number of agricultural workers in that county as I already mentioned before. So that ratio tells us labor productivity. How much output do we get per worker? And we know how many workers are affected so we can multiply those things to get an, an estimate of the amount of lost productivity potentially at play. So that, that's what this dashboard reports. So there's the link down at the bottom of the screen. If, if you want it, uh, feel free to email me about it. But this screenshot, um, you know, essentially at the, shows you at the state levels, um, the number of agricultural workers that, that have uh, COVID cases to date, cumulative to date. And then you can click on the top to, to click on different agricultural products to see our estimate of the share of that total production that we're estimating to potentially be at risk because of COVID. So this, I took the screenshot um, a while back. So back when I took it, you can see there, we were estimating about 48,000 uh, agricultural workers that have COVID. Now here's a new screenshot that I took just yesterday. So you can see it's about 200,000 now that we're estimating today and every state is kind of red. Um, the other thing I'll point out is even today, and this is an overestimate for reasons I, I won't, for time's sake, won't explain, but, you know, I think this tab is on edible beans. Uh, we're estimating the total risk of production is about two to three percent. So very small. And there's good reasons to think that's an overestimate because we're saying if somebody came down with COVID, they aren't productive for the entire year, which is not probably true. Um, but even still, I think one conclusion from this is that you know, the risk to agricultural production haven't been severe in terms of just quantity of food supply. Uh, doesn't mean that it's not consequential, but at least it, it helps us focus our attention on where the risks are, and they're probably more in processing that I mentioned the meat packing sector earlier. Um, if you want to, on the same tool, you can drill into any individual state. So here's Indiana and see how different counties are faring and you get county level data that's over here. So um, this is kind of interesting. In fact, when those the meat packing plants were going down, even though we're not measuring, we're only measuring farm workers. We're not measuring, you know, food processing, meat packing workers, but even still Indiana has two big pork packing plants. One's about here, one's about here. Um, and during that time, you could actually see those counties were, were highlighted as kind of hot spot cases for agricultural workers, which makes sense. Those are relatively rural counties to begin with. Um, and so there, there's, uh, you know, but we, it was kind of maybe some confirmation to see that we were showing, the, these spots were showing up in our maps at the same time they were sort of hitting the news. Okay, so that was kind of version 1.0. Um, and I, we're in the process of trying to update this tool in a number of ways. I've got a, a working paper that's out now. Um, so one of the things I've learned through this process is that the media mainly has been way more interested not in our risk to agricultural production, but our estimate of the, the number of workers that are affected. And so what I've done as a consequence is, is go back and try to separate out different kinds of workers. And in, in the census of agriculture, they separate workers uh, as follows. There's, there's producers. This is probably what you think about when you think about the word farmer. This is anybody on the farm that has decision-making authority, has day-to-day -day decision making uh, authority on, on the farm. Uh, there are hired workers. These are people that are hired as, as labor on that same farm. Uh, there is unpaid workers. So mainly this is probably in large part family um, and then migrant workers. So some migrant, oops, some migrant workers are also hired workers, but not all hired workers are migrant workers. And moreover, so some migrant workers are, are, are not hired labor, they're contracted labor. So they don't show up the same. So the reason I say that is you don't wanna add all these numbers together. You'd probably get some double counting. Um, the previous slide I showed you is adding together the top two because they're, they're not exactly, exactly mutually exclusive, but they're pretty close to it. Um, and so these are estimates of the number of cases among these different types of workers. And then our estimate of the, of the number of deaths and the incidence rates relative to the number of all agricultural producers in the United States or uh, say hired agricultural workers in the United States. And if you're wondering like, are these numbers large or small? Well, here's on that same day, November 5th, when I ran these numbers, um, the overall po general population had an incidence rate of cases of about 2.94. So a little higher um, in the agricultural community than in the general, um, general population. Um, I can take these numbers. We have some national accounts on um, you know, relating different input uses to total uh, agricultural output uses. 
here I'm trying to make an adjustment for the fact that if you're just sick, you know, you're probably losing two to three weeks of productivity, not an entire year's worth, unless you're over here in the death category. So doing all that, I'm saying, you know, up to this date of November 5th, there's maybe been a 0.02% reduction in our annual agricultural labor supply. Uh, so that's pretty small, but when you multiply that times the value of the agricultural sector and the value that's potentially lost from that, to date, the estimate is it's probably about $98 million in potential agricultural output loss from, from this reduction in, in labor supply from COVID. Um, you know, this is some of the newer work we're doing where we're trying to estimate trends over time in, in cases. And I'll just point out a couple of kind of interesting things here. Um, uh, one is that um, when the, this black line is the total population, when cases were, you know, we had this big spike, these are the rolling seven day average of new cases. In the total population here in April and May, there was kind of a decline in the, the number of new cases. But actually, the, in the agricultural sector, our estimates are that was increasing. And this is probably mainly due to you know, cases moving mainly from urban areas to more rural areas. So even though the trends look, look pretty you know, like they're going together, that's not true, particularly in this time period. These, these correlations are negative. And in the more recent time period here coming up on the last few weeks or months, the rate uh, in the, among our agricultural workers um, is probably is not probably it is a little higher. You can see that actually more. This is a this is deaths. Um, the rate of deaths that we're estimating among agricultural producers, you can see, is much is increasing at a much faster rate than the overall population. This is speculative, but some of that could be due to the fact that you know th these are hitting more in rural areas where maybe healthcare and healthcare facilities are are less um, less well equipped to deal with some of these problems. Uh, this is just a just distribution of the migrant worker cases as of November 5th. Again, you can see where the, the majority of those are, mainly California, Washington, Oregon, and some here in, in Florida. That also overlays pretty well with just where, where migrant workers are in, in, in particular, although there's a fair, fair number in Texas, which at this date haven't, you know, aren't living in counties where we've seen a lot of COVID cases to date. Um, one thing you may be interested in, people kind of ask, are agricultural workers more vulnerable to COVID? Well, we don't really know that for sure, but we can kind of ask a slightly different question, which is re related to that, which is, you know, in counties, um, are counties that have a lot of agricultural workers, do they tend to have a higher or lower incident race, rate than counties that don't have a lot of agricultural workers? So I have those four types of workers that I showed you earlier, um, but the two that seem to be have the highest relationship are the hired workers and the migrant workers. And you know, our estimate is that a 1% increase in the number of hired agricultural workers in a county is associated with a, about a 0.064% increase in the incident COVID-19 incidence rates in that county. You can see the death rates there too. So uh, certainly not one-to-one, -one, but it also is the case, these, these are statistically significant, that if you're in a county that with more migrant workers or more hired workers, um, the incidence rate in that county is going to tend to be a little bit higher. So it does seem to suggest that that maybe uh, incidence of COVID is, is higher in those communities where, where there's more agricultural workers. So what's ahead? Um, as I said, the tool today is still just uh, as I showed you on the dashboard, but we want to update those with some of these different types of workers and maybe with a little fine, a little finer focus on workers, which could just mainly because that's where a lot of the interest has been. I think the real risk to our food supply, as I mentioned earlier, is, has not really been on the farm side, but in the processing side, particularly those areas where there's a lot of labor density. And so we're gonna we're working on a new dashboard that's focused on that processing sector that updates in real time. And there's some, there's some good USDA data and others that gets released on a daily basis that we can bring to bear on that. And then also, I think we saw a nice dashboard right before this focused on the food environment, but we, I want something that, that updates in real time or something close to real time. One problem with uh, a lot of our food retail price data, say the, like the data that goes into the CPI, the Consumer Price Index, uh, that, that's released by the Bureau of Labor Statistics. It only comes out every month and it's delayed by about a month. So it's still useful, but it's not super timely, uh, but there are some you know, some information that comes out on a more daily basis. And that's something we're gonna be working on uh, over the next year or so. So uh, with that, I'll stop and certainly happy to answer some questions. 
Thank you so much, Jason. That was really wonderful. Um, I just wanted to share one of the questions that's in the Q&A um, window here. Um, and someone wanted to know if you could mention again the primary data sources for the dashboard that you created. So the number of cases comes from the Johns Hopkins uh, University website. Um, they've got a GitHub website updates daily with county level cases. So I should say all the cases we're tracking are county level cases. There's a lot of cases, not a lot, but there are cases that are unassigned to a county and we just don't use those in this calculation. The, all the ag data at the moment is coming from the US Census of Agriculture. The last time that was done is in 2017. Why that data source? The, the reason is because it, it's the most complete in terms of county level data. In, in terms of ag production, it's pretty good. You don't get a lot of changes from year to year in terms of the, the volume of production on a county level basis. And the ag worker data also comes from that same uh, 2017 Census of Agriculture. Uh, the only other data that comes in is population. That's the Census Bureau. Excellent, thank you. Um, we've now uh, learned about a dashboard that covered uh, the world. We've learned about one that covered uh, the nation and we're gonna move to one that is uh, more on the local level. Uh, Pahini, if you'd like to um, start your presentation, that'd be really wonderful. Hello everyone, um, I'm Pahini Lampart and I'm going to be presenting today uh, what our Baltimore City food distribution response was to um, the unprecedented COVID-19 challenge. My apologies. Uh, so in the beginning, uh, what we what came to our desk, um, I'm a part of CityStat and our mission is to use data to assist city agencies to respond to challenges. What came to our desk uh, was that there was going to be a cross agency collaboration um, in response to what was occurring in Baltimore City. Department of Planning accurately forecasted that food insecurity in our city would jump from one in four to one in three by June. Unfortunately, that prediction uh, came to fruition. This was the first time the city was going to be mobilizing food resources in this manner. There was no blueprint, so we were going in um, knowing that there were going to be a lot of challenges along the way. Collaboration and coordination among agencies um, that traditionally operate independently was going to be another challenge. And um, this was something that everyone knew up front and came to the table knowing that there was a lot of work ahead of us. So this kind of shows you what the layout of the land was. Um, this, is, this is a graphic that shows all of the different pieces of the puzzle um, that went into the interagency collaboration. What CityStat was asked to do was to create a tool that could be used to make sure that the city's food needs were being met and that all executive leaders could look at the same data to drive Baltimore City's strategy. In the beginning, the leaders were meeting on a daily basis and uh, discussing the volume of food that had been distributed. And they wanted to know what the trends were, what, um, at, what a snapshot of 
distribution in the city look like on a daily basis. So I'm going to exit this and go over to the internal dashboard. This is something that um, I updated on a daily basis. Now, this was the first page and the, it does exactly what I described um, that leaders were looking for. They wanted a snapshot of what was happening on a daily basis. So the first table just shows you, um, I wasn't allowed to share the a live internal dashboard, but um, I was able to share one that was shared, uh, that was um, published previously. So this is one from July. Um, it shows you what happened on July 13th, um, I mean, July 14th. So this is something that I published on July 15th. And it shows you that uh, the number of meals distributed was 27,000. Leaders wanted to know what the breakdown of those meals looked like, um, which agents, how the agencies were performing. And then we also had grocery boxes uh, that began to be distributed in response to um, demand by uh, our constituents and then also produce boxes. Yeah. And this table below right here shows you uh, the meals that were served in March 16, which is when the shutdown went into effect. This next page is um, the more visually attractive page. Uh, and it gives you insight into much of the trends that are occurring in the city. So this map right here uh, shows you uh, the volume uh, of food that is being distributed throughout the city. The bigger the circle, uh, the uh, greater the volume. And then um, this shows you the total meals by facility. So there were different facility types and it corresponded to um, various agencies. So we wanted to know what the breakdown throughout the city was. And then um, this chart right here, I gave the seven day uh, rolling average. And we went with seven day rolling average because uh, we wanted to know what the trend at a weekly, on a weekly basis was. And as you can see, we um, peaked around May. Um, and what I, you, oh yeah, okay. Yeah, at our highest, I think we were around 75,000. Uh, today we're a lot, um, we're not as high as we were at our peak, but we were responding to what the need was uh, and not focused on just ensuring that the greatest number of meals were distributed. So even throughout the week, you can see um, that usually around Wednesday, Thursday was the highest days of, um, the greatest days of distribution. And we could see throughout the week um, what the ebbs and flows look like. And this is something that um, the leaders used originally on a daily basis. And today they look at it on a weekly basis. To the right over here is um, all of the sites that were operational and the number, um, the number of meals that have been distributed to date. So when it came to when it came to potential closures or um, wanting to activate new sites based on where there may be um, demand for meals that isn't being addressed, this is what uh, city leaders would look at uh, to see what the next move could be. And the last page of the dashboard was more so provided for um, those that were uh, looking at. Uh, looking at the data that was entered on a daily basis. This chart right here um, is the most up-to-date uh, distribution chart for uh, meals being distributed, um, not chart, this map right here, excuse me. Um, oh. 
meals being distributed in the city currently. Um, as you can see that in, uh, there's a lot of uh, sites, 66 distributing produce boxes. Uh, we have uh, sites distributing grocery boxes. And most recently we added a mixed box, which is a mix of pro uh, produce, dairy, and meat. Uh, there's also youth grab and go meals being served at 111 sites. Um, there's older adult meals. Now these are all uh, managed by uh, various agencies and it's just codified uh, to, for uh, codified to help the citizens see where these meals are being distributed. Okay. So this is what it kind of took to activate all of this. Our first step was to use Esri apps uh, to build out surveys for agencies to submit their locations and also the meals that were being distributed. So um, all of the locations that had been submitted was imported into a live map um, and we used the Live Nearby app um, to build out a tool um, that citizens could use um, to even on their phones to be able to see what was the closest uh, meal site by them. Uh, I have that pulled up and I can show you what that looks like here. So when you uh, went into the Find Nearby app, you would see where all of the meals were being distributed. And over here, you could put in any address. Um, I'm going to put in mine um, just to show. But it would tell you what the closest meal sites uh, by me were. So these were food pantry sites. This we got directly from Maryland Food Bank. They gave, a, they gave us a layer of their food pantry sites um, that I added in. And then these are all the Baltimore city food distribution locations. So these are all the sites that the city activated in response. And then these are the grassroots organizations. Um, the Department of Planning started collecting data on how the community organizations were operating and they built their own layer and shared it with me. And I also imported that into the live map. Now the meals um, survey, there was an additional challenge. Um, we built out the survey, but we needed to be able to sort um, by the different locations. But what we ended up doing was building a dashboard in Esri uh, that took into account the different agencies that would be contributing data um, and then the sites that were relevant to them. Um, ooh, the sites that were relevant to them. Um, and then they could fill in their, uh, their meals information. Now we took the back end meals data and we took the locations data um, and, Im and imported it into uh, the dashboard that I showed you earlier. And that's what the city leaders were using on a daily basis for their internal assessment of how things were going in Baltimore City. Now this next slide shows you what um, we ended up, uh, we ended up having to do for the fall. Now we were moving from um, the summer meals program that we activated in response to the shutdown. The schools were uh, shut down, everything was shut down. So um, we geared up to activate as many sites as possible. But moving into the fall, uh, we knew that um, we knew that schools would uh, might be reopening. We hadn't been sure. Uh, so we asked schools, what are the sites that you can activate if the schools are still shut down? And they gave us a list of 83 sites and um, Reckon Park said there are nine uh, there are nine locations if the um, if the schools are shut down that we're planning on activating uh, to provide meals in the uh, in the evening time from four to six 
So this is what we started with for the fall sites. Um, but then we looked at, we actually collaborated with Esri uh, and asked them, you know, what are, so what are some layers you may have that um, we can use to assess uh, what sites or where we can ensure that sites need to be active. And what they um, came back with was, why don't you use CDC social vulnerability index? And um, if you have if you have data for areas where there might be greater uh, immigrant populations, um, that's something you can use as well. So I partnered with MIMA um, and uh, we looked at the SNAP data that we had, original SNAP data that we had to create layers. And um, I created a quarter mile buffer and a half mile buffer. Um, and the city decided that our goal would be to ensure that at least within a half, uh, at least within a half mile, but closer to a quarter mile, we would have uh, sites available, especially for our vulnerable populations. And that was our goal. The, this doesn't have um, all of the locations in here. This, this is just a snapshot of what we started with. Uh, but what I showed you in the live map is what the result was. Some of the lessons learned from this whole process. Um, the first one, it was the more time you take to plan to address uh, the city's needs, the smoother and more effective the execution. As with anything else, the more time you take to think about all of the things that could go wrong. I mean, um, as far as the logistics goes, there's transportation, there's food supply, the list is endless. So to think through each of the pieces, it, um, it takes time and you really have to sit on it a, a bit and to not have to then uh, go back and you know, address things as issues come up. Number two, uh, competition has a role, but should always be the lowest priority when it comes to collaboration, especially uh, when it comes to citywide strategy. I put this in there uh, because I noticed that throughout this process, um, the leaders of each agency were on it. Uh, I have to say all of, uh, most of the agency's leaders were women and um, I can't tell you how um, inspiring it was that each of them uh, came to the table every day and now every week uh, saying, okay, how are we gonna make sure that no one in the city goes hungry and everyone had developed their own strategy quite compelling and um, it, it, was, it was very heartening to see. It inspired me as I was working on it. Um, but I do think that uh, if we had focused on collaboration over um, each agency taking their, um, taking their own strategy and running with it, we could have um, created a more comprehensive approach from the beginning. Number three, always keep the big picture in mind and the mission at the forefront. Um, I, I think that when, uh, after you are doing something for, uh, on a daily basis for a long period of time, it's, uh, it, it's, it becomes a lot. Um, I, I don't think that uh, it's easy to always wake up and think about what, um, what you're doing this for uh, so every time we started a, a discussion, we would always talk about, uh, you know, what the purpose of uh, this food distribution was. And lastly, the only control uh, you can exercise in these times is control over yourself. Uh, and you have to really think about the energy that you bring to the table. Um, I, I can't stress this enough that uh, in these times, I think everyone feels drained. Uh, so when I went into each of these discussions, I really wanted to bring my best self. And I always wanted to focus on um, filling the cups of everyone that I interacted with. And I stress this because data entry is not something that um, most of these agencies uh, did on a daily basis. And when they volunteered to do so, uh, I could, uh, it was in the beginning, it was very difficult to make sure all data was provided by 9am. 
Um, so what I started doing is really building relationships with each of the data providers. And um, I think in, not to toot my own horn, but in addition to data and analysis, I think um, one of my gifts is the ability to build relationships. And in each of these conversations, what I really wanted to bring to the table and what I wanted to express is that we have the power to change the narrative of Baltimore City. <laughs> And um, I think that we did so successfully. Um, and I really think that this could be a roadmap that uh, could be used by other cities um, moving forward, because unfortunately, I don't think that this is the last of um, the, a potentially a scary situation where uh, food access and food needs uh, will be an issue. Jamie. Thank you so, yeah, oh, thank you so much, Bahini. Um, I really appreciated those uh, lessons learned at the end and your perspective on what it's been like uh, working in Baltimore City, um, the food distribution efforts there for uh, the past, how many months are we in there now? Um, six, seven, eight months now. Um, and one of the questions I wanted to ask you was, uh, what was the update process like uh, on a daily basis for you to collect that information from all your providers and putting Put it into your dashboard so that people could look at um, the change from on a day-to-day -day basis. Yeah, so um, that dashboard, that daily update dashboard that I was talking about is what each of the agency data providers used um, to input their data. And then what I did was use the Esri um, API from that dashboard um, to uh, and I actually, this dashboard that I was showing, it was built in Power BI, but I used the Esri APIs for the locations and um, the daily meals. I pulled it into Power BI um, and all, and then after that, all I had to do was uh, click refresh on a daily basis and pull, and the data would be pulled in automatically. The challenge there was, you know, uh, as I said, agencies after, providing data on a daily basis, there was some data lethargy and, um, you know, I'd have to contact them to make sure that the data was entered and help them if there were issues. But I do think that, um, I do think that after all the dashboard pieces were built out, um, on my end, it was quite, it, it, it was quite easy to just be able to um, just click refresh and bring all of those pieces in and publish it. Excellent, thank you. Um, really valuable information to share to a lot of other people looking to do similar work. I was wondering if you could stop sharing your screen, Bahini, and if the other speakers wouldn't mind um, turning on their video and their audio. And um, I just wanted to give um, Jason, Jess, and Rebecca an opportunity to share some of the lessons that they've learned um, through building their own uh, dashboard, similar to what Bahini shared with us just a second ago. Um, either one or any of you want to take a stab at that? I mean, I can start and maybe it'll stimulate a conversation. I think with the global food systems dashboard, you know, one of the things we tried to do in collecting indicators is ensure that all countries are represented. You know, there's lots of data in the United States or Australia or some other high income countries, but we really wanted to create equity across the dashboard and not have the dashboard become a high income food systems dashboard. But we also have other, you know, massive data gaps around diets, consumer behavior, which some of you may have noted, we have zero indicators on the dashboard for consumer behavior. So we're always constrained by the data gap side, you know, and a bit to Jason's point around real time data, we are we don't have any, you know, it's diet data, undernutrition data, some of this data comes around every five years. So we really struggle with not only gaps in data, but the the real time decision making that you want to, to have happen. We just really don't get and you know, many low income countries, there's big data gaps. So just wanted to throw that out there as one of our biggest challenges. That's really great. Anybody else 
Sorry, Rebecca, go ahead. That's okay. Um, yeah, some of the other challenges have been like one of our big goals is trying to make it as understandable and user friendly as we can, because um, a lot of data, especially for a lot of people without strong data backgrounds or who haven't spent a lot of time doing that, it's hard to take lessons away from that or decide what to do with it. Um, and also we have a big team and then we've been trying to, with these workshops and other user testing, get feedback from as many people. So just trying to figure out um, one thing that's easily understandable to one person may not be to another person and trying to find the best way to make it useful for a really broad range of users has been challenging, but also really important for us. Um, I, I mentioned this in my talk, but I think I was surprised at what people found valuable about our tool. It's not what I expected. Like I, I, was, I was calculating the number of workers that were sick as an input to another calculation, but it turns out people didn't care about the main thing I was interested in. <laughs> um, um, so, uh, but it, it was, you know, I, I worked with a really good team at Microsoft and they, they thought that was important, put that on the dashboard too. So that team and having, having other people bring their perspectives, I think is useful. Um, one of the downsides of having, a, you know, working directly with some really excellent, you know, software engineers and computer engineers at Microsoft is, uh, when they went away and I want to make changes, it's, it's, it's harder. And so, um, and that's, uh, I've, you know, fortunately been able to find some more funding to update that need to do that in the near future. But um, keeping these things running and sometimes when there has been mistakes, you know, you have these APIs and just pull in data and occasionally when something goes wrong there, uh, especially in a real time dashboard, you don't always know why. And, you know, it takes some digging there too. Uh, one other, this isn't a lesson learned, but uh, uh, this is true of probably any dashboard, particularly in our case, where we're estimating something. We don't really have much way to ground truth the estimates is, you know, in this as an illustration, in the same day, I got emails from folks, mainly because I think we were quoted in the New York Times or something, saying our estimate, one group saying our estimate was way too low and another estimate saying our estimate was way too high. So, you know, and both of them were, you know, kind of farm worker advocacy groups. You know, one thought we were trying to make farm workers look bad um, and we're, we're over inflating how risky they were to the population. The other thought we were not making it look bad enough. That they're really a very vulnerable population, more vulnerable than most people realize. So maybe that means we're about where we should be. <laughs> so I was wondering, you guys were talking about feedback from users and from the general public. And I was wondering, how did you build feedback, maybe like a feedback tool into your dashboard so that you could elicit responses from people that were actively using your dashboards. So I can quickly touch on that um, since I mentioned it, but we have a contact us on the site that people can send feedback to. Um, so that's one way that we've actually gotten a fair amount of, con of um, feedback from, um, and we monitor that and either respond or make changes accordingly. Um, we also have our team is big, like I think in, when Jess is part of her presentation, she showed all the different collaborators and partners. Um, so at least we do get a lot of different people using it and put, giving input in the design and then once it's up stage. And then now we're starting to do more country engagement. So I mentioned we had the first virtual, um, first part of a virtual workshop in Senegal and have another one planned in Ethiopia and have talks with um, maybe about a dozen other countries to do similar workshops where we can sort of present the dashboard in one session and then are planning having um, one session that's just devoted to feedback. So getting after people have had a chance to see it and use it, what works for them, what doesn't work for them, what's missing, um, what could be improved. So really trying and to- And webinars and panels like this help too, because we get, mm -hmm. we see a lot of feedback in the Q and A and the chats, you know, right. so right. it helps, yeah. Um, for, for me, the, my feedback came from the city leaders and um, they were very forthcoming with uh, what KPIs they wanted to be measured. So it wasn't difficult for me to um, get feedback. The difficult part was just prioritizing what, um, what should be displayed on uh, the dashboard because I think um, I think when people look at data, they just want to see everything. Uh, so uh, just prioritizing and making sure that it's uh, useful for everyone. 
um, you know, my email address, I think is listed right below our dashboard. So I just get the emails. <laughs> um, the, um, and it, I think maybe to Jess's point, actually a lot of the questions I got, it made me understand, made, made me go back and try to understand the data better on even some things like what, what really, you know, is, are these agricultural worker measures, you know, and what, what is it measuring? And, and then people that were actually pretty knowledgeable that helped me understand, you know, strengths and weaknesses of what we were doing relative to others. That's been actually very interesting. I mean, I, mean, I, I, I don't study agricultural workers. This was in response to such, sort of a crisis, you know, situation trying to provide good information. Um, and so it's been really nice learning from some experts in the field about, you know, the, some of the nuances around even what we're reporting. So I'd like to ask um, if you could talk about the technology that you use to build your dashboards and how you ended up choosing that particular combination of uh, technologies to build your dashboards. And maybe if you could share also lessons learned on that front as well. I, mean, we, I think I mentioned mine, but we, um, I was the, we have some pretty regular conversations with the chief scientists at Microsoft. Um, Ranveer Chandra, in, um, and so he saw this as an opportunity to try to collect real-time data related to COVID. And so uh, as a consequence of that, we use a Power BI dashboard, which is a Microsoft project uh, product. And to be honest, I was not the one, you know, doing the behind the scenes work on that. So I can't comment much about the, the input side, but I'd say the functionality has been pretty fantastic in, in terms of the, there's some things I'd like to look different now that I kind of have a better sense of what we want to be reporting, but that's the, that's the, at least the, the uh, software side of what we're doing. Um, we also used Power BI. I mean, we're Baltimore City, it's free. And we uh, like to, uh, we like to, use as much um, free things as we can before we start paying for things. So we use Power BI and we had um, Esri licenses. However, um, to use Esri maps in Power BI, uh, you need a pro license uh, that is quite expensive. And I am just an analyst. Uh, so we ended up using Mapbox Visual to use the, uh, to display the food volume. But um, on the Esri side, we used much of their tools and applications in order to be, act to get the data prepared uh, before we actually pulled it into Power BI. Like I said, we used the Esri API um, and pulled it into Power BI that way. I think the challenges of being able to pull it into Power BI was that they have a max amount of records that you could pull in. So after 10,000 records, uh, I saw that I just, nothing was coming in and uh, it was really scary, <laughs> but I worked with Esri then uh, in, uh, and they helped me um, increase the amount of records that could be pulled in. So on our side, we work with a group, um, iTech Mission, based in India, that does our back end, um, all the development work. So I can't speak really at all, unfortunately, to that side of things. Um, I don't know if Jess has anything to add, but I think she's probably in the same boat as I am. Um, yeah. I was wondering, just from looking at it, if there was some Tableau that was used in it um, to display your maps and data, or was it something maybe more customized? I know we've had people on our team side. So sorry, Jess. I, did, I said, I don't think that iTech uses Tableau. Um, oh. They use something different. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah, I was going to say, we've had some of our team members use Tableau, like when we've been brainstorming ideas or, um, but I, yeah, I can't speak to exactly what iTech mission uses. Okay, we only unfortunately have a few minutes left here, maybe three more minutes. So I know that each of you talked about um, sort of the future of your projects, um, but wanted to give you an opportunity to talk about sort of next steps that you see for your particular dashboards uh, moving forward. And um, as I said, this, we only have a couple minutes left, so um, maybe keep your comments short. 
Well, I think for us, you know, it's really getting this diagnostics done because right now you go to the, the dashboard and you, it just describes food systems, but you don't know how to act. You don't know if they're on or off track or if they're doing well. So we're trying to create some guidance on, um, based on some outcomes, developing thresholds for some of the indicators that would allow for policymakers to quickly have a snapshot and of where their food systems are at beyond just you know looking at trends over time of different indicators. So I think that's kind of our big push right now in anticipation for the United Nations Food Systems Summit next year. We hope that uh, the, the dashboard is used as a tool in uh, how a country set up their national commitments for that summit. And then some of the other things Rebecca had mentioned. <laughs> On my end, I, I mentioned some of the future tools we want to develop, but in terms of the existing one, I think it's separating out these different kinds of workers because there's been a lot of interest in that. And then um, maybe a little bit related to what Jess said, making it easier to see where the hot spots are, um, identify those in a more uh, in a way where you don't have to drill into each, you know, uh, state and, and look. I think that that's something that seems like a no brainer. Um, Jason, uh, for you to get the hotspots, uh, you can do heat maps in Power BI, and they're they're quite effective. Um, thank you. Yeah, see, it's good. You get to current. You get to learn by even <laughs> from your fellow panelists. So thank you, Fahini. Yeah, that. <laughs> no problem. Uh, I I have learned so much about Power BI. I did not use it this much and um, before this, and it was it, it was a great learning opportunity. Um, for us, since this is an internal dashboard that was created in response to COVID, it's going to um, continue through the end of COVID. But I think uh, what, or I'm hoping the plan is uh, that uh, we will take all of the data that's generated and uh, reflect on it to create a further long-term strategy because food insecurity is not going anywhere. And it's an issue that Baltimore City has faced for a very long time. And I'm hoping this will give us what we need to figure out how we can strengthen the food systems in our city. Very good point. It's a great place to end. I'm gonna share my screen here and put up a final slide. Um, oops. There we go. I wanted to say thank you to each of our panelists. Uh, wonderful presentations and a great question and answer period. Um, again, this recording will be available after all our sessions are complete on the event landing page. We have five sessions left in our first ever virtual GIS week. So if you're interested, please feel free to check them out. We'll drop the registration link and links to our sponsors web pages in that chat box. Again, uh, thanks to our co-sponsors, the Center for a Liberal Future and the Spatial Science for Public Health Center. If you're interested in learning more about either center, we will put their links in the chat box as well. Again, thank you and enjoy the rest of your day, everybody.